by way of introduction, say you had to put up with me a few months ago, and that, uh, and in that presentation on my layout, I uh, basically said, well, I was really interested in operations, which is which is true, and so my operating background goes back to when I was in junior high school a number of years ago, and uh, started out uh, on a four by six piece of plywood, HO, HO Railroad, and uh, car routing was done by tabs on cars. And so we'll be talking a little bit about that later on. So this uh, fascination kind of went on. And, uh, oh, I guess about 20 years ago, I got interested in how did the real rail, real narrow gauge railroads run? And that got me into, uh, into a search and a rabbit hole and discovery of timetable and train order and all kinds of things like that. And I wish I knew then what I know now about that subject, because my railroad would have probably been different. But I guess I'm living proof that uh, even if you didn't design the railroad to uh, do all of this stuff, you can still adapt things. So with that, let's go ahead and get started here. So the uh, first thing I'd like to share here is, is this is my opinion. If a train is moving, you're operating, except yeah, we won't we won't count test tracks and things of this sort. But if it's on a diorama or a railroad or anything else, trains moving, you're operating. And there's really kind of, uh, if you will, two two ways to look at this. One is on the left side. I just want to relax and rail fan what's moving. On the right side, boy, I want to replicate the prototype exactly. And there's an awful lot of space in between those two two extremes. So it's really it's only a question of where you want to be on this on this spectrum. So looking at this is down on the lower left hand corner is the rail fan portion of it. It's you basically make up what you think you want to watch roll and enjoy. Uh, in addition to that, there's some things you can do to enhance that experience with some prototype train handling. If you want to move up and you're looking for something else, a little switching, well, there's an awful lot of options here on how to do that. And I'm going to make the statement that some formality usually makes this more engaging and fun. And my experience is having a lot of people over uh, to the railroad over the last uh, close to 30 years now. If you don't provide a structure, many folks will opt not to switch any cars. They just will take the throttle, look at it and say, well, no, thanks. You say, here, can you do this? Then all of a sudden they can get engaged. And so that that's one of the one of the things I've, I've learned here. And then moving further on up is if you're serving customers on the line, uh, if you've got more than one train at a time, Safety is paramount, and you've got lots of options here on how we can go about that. I think the good news for us narrow gauges are is, is operations are a lot simpler than the big time mainline folks. Uh, however, the caveat is you can make this as complex as you want. So there's a couple of basics, um, and I'm going to say no matter where you want to be on this operating spectrum, one of the things you've got to work on is you've got to have reliable and smooth operating locomotives and rolling stock. Next thing is you've got to have solid trouble-free track work. And then the third item is trouble-free and reliable electrical controls and throttles. And there's nothing like having some friends over to help you discover what needs to be tuned up. I know all of us layout owners, is we tend to get used to things and overlook things. It turns out your friends aren't going to be quite so so generous to you if you come over and say, yeah, can you help me shake this down and, and, and play trains? Uh, they're going to point out what needs to be fixed. And I can tell you that kind of feedback is just absolutely critical for um, addressing those uh, top three items there. And I guess what we're talking about, uh, I just want a rail fan, is consider the realism of running a train your engine and train motion. I mean, these are big and heavy. I mean, they, they don't start on a dime, they don't stop on a dime. You're switching, safety first, move at walking speed or about five miles an hour. The other thing is, is making slow joints and couplings here is you aren't damaging all the freight, so your claims agents are gonna be a lot happier. They aren't gonna be having to pay out damaged goods to, uh, to customers. And what the DCC manufacturers and other people have done is just brought us all kinds of really good sound to work with. So you can actually simulate what a real locomotive sounds like when it's working. You can take the time, you can pause to let the brakeman off to line a switch, pause to let the brakeman tie down or release handbrakes, couple up airlines, set up retainers. You put cars together or stretch them to make sure they're coupled. 
I don't know how many sessions I've been at where somebody's in a hurry and they think they've got a joint and they take off at a, out of town and half their train is still sitting there. Just doing something simple like the prototype there will, uh, you know, help out a lot and make it a little bit more realistic and then save you from a good nature ribbing. Uh, the other thing is, is make an air, air test before leaving town and you say, well, what's that? Well, this is where you're you're pumping up the air. You've got people walking the train, basically making sure all the brakes are set up properly. So what do you do when you're doing that? Well, if you're operating and you've got a got a list of cars that you're going to take with you, you can go ahead and check that list of cars against the cars in your train to make sure you have the right stuff. And then another thing here is if you're leaving in an area, is line all your switches back to the normal position. There's uh, This is going to help a train that follows you or a train that's coming against you basically come in and arrive on the track they're supposed to they think they're supposed to be arriving on as opposed to uh running off on a dead end siding and having to make a uh, an emergency stop and the other thing is if you've got water stops if you're wood fired you're going to be you're going to be wooding up if you're cold you're going to be taking coal occasionally all these things add to the time and the pleasure and basically the realism of uh of rail fanning, like I said, and the simulations will make your railroad seem larger. If we look at another building block along the spectrum, and that's switching, car routing, and serving customers. And you really got to have a couple of things going on for this. One is a means to assign empty cars and loads to customers, and two, assign loads and empties out. Second item is, yeah, you're going to need some sort of a way to uh, figure out which train is going to serve which customers? And then last, you've got to be able to communicate the work that needs to be done to the individuals that are running a train. So what I'm going to focus on from here is the business of assigning cars. And there's, in the hobby, all kinds of ways of being able to do this. I mean, including using dice and spinners and things of this sort. And I'm not going to say much about those. Um, we will talk about car tabs. And we're going to talk about car cards and waybills, waybills themselves, car cards with sequence destinations, switch lists, and computer-generated car routing and switch lists. So kind of moving on, let's start with a simple car tab example. Um, what a car tab is, it's something that basically physically rides on the car. And the color of the tab denotes the town it's going to typically, and a letter or a number talks about the industry it's supposed to be delivered to in that town. Uh, people have come up with all kinds of ways to do this, including colored thumbtacks with holes in the roofs of things, um, H channels from, cut from styrene. Maybe you can get two routings out of that by painting the, uh, the center of the H the color of the town and uh, lettering that, or flipping it over, painting it another color. So you do that. This particular system doesn't let you know anything about the uh, content of the car or anything else. It just simply will move, move cars as you directed on that. Another way is switch lists. And these things can be, they can be handwritten, written, they can be computer printed or computer program generated. And on the left-hand side, you're looking at a switch list here that uh, is intended to be handwritten. You basically look around the yard, decide what you want to move. You write down the car initials, the number, <clears throat> and where you want it to go and where you're moving it to and from. The interesting thing is looking at switch lists from the prototype is the switch lists were generally made up, and if they were handwritten, the form itself was a suggestion. Usually the conductor or whoever was making it up Use, use this as a piece of company provided paper to uh, write down what he thought he wanted to do and the order he wanted to do it. So you've got a lot of flexibility there. The next switch list over is uh, one that Jack Burgess runs in his operating session. And you can see that uh, what he's done, this is assigned to train number 15 at El Portel. And at El Portel, he says, well, <clears throat> Train number 15 is going to make up a train consisting of four boxcars. Three of them are going to go to Merced. One of them is going to go to Merced Falls. And he talks about when you get to those locations where that car is going to be delivered. Then he skips down and he said, well, at Merced, Merced Falls, is you're going to pick up two more cars headed for Merced. Uh, but from the list up above, you've got one you're going to be dropping off there. And so you just basically work this list and work on, on down through it. 
On the flip side of Jack's way bills is what she included over here on the right is basically the outline of each of the towns along the, the right of way, along with the identification of the various places that cars can be picked up or spotted from. And it, this is it. Some people really enjoy this. Some people will use car cards to actually make up a switch list and go out and, and do it that way. Uh, another version of this is a, is a car card with sequence destinations. And this has been around for quite a while, and it's done with, has been done with file cards with paper clips that you move down down the list. And what this what this system does is it combines not only where does it go, how does it how does it move next, and on the way down until it gets to where you want it to go at the end of the line, and then you can go ahead and use the other column. The way this kind of a card is used is once you figure this out and you have the routing included in there. Um, the, true, the crew that spots the car at that location puts a backslash in the box saying, okay, the car is here. Between sessions, the layout owner goes around and he adds a forward slash that makes an X in the box, and that shows the car is ready to move to the next destination. And so you just work down the list like this. And it'll take a number of sessions to work through this, but this is another way to do it. You don't know what the contents are or anything else, but at least it, it's going to help you move cars on your railroad. And then we're going to talk talk about the sort of classical card card and waybill example. And the example I showed here is is no longer available. It was these were uh, forms and pads and things you could buy from a company called Old Line Graphics, and uh, they, they work on uh, on this. You can see the card gets folded up to make a pocket. You use scotch tape to basically tape the pocket up there, and then you have a waybill that has two sides to it. And they're lettered one, two, three, and four. And on this way bill is it tells you where this car is going to go, where it's coming from, what the contents are, and you can write those for all four sides. There's a misconception about these that said, well, you have to follow everything in order. And the answer is, well, you really don't. You can basically flip these cards in any order that you want <laughs> between sessions. And in fact, you can have multiple cards you know, that you can pull in and out if you say, well, I really don't like this routing anymore. And on the right hand side is just what it looks like with a, with a waybill inserted in the card. Currently, you can buy a similar car card and waybill system uh, from Micromark, or you can make these things yourself if you want to. It's not too hard using, using an Excel spreadsheet. So this is a modified, what I call a modified car card and waybill example. And this is, this is what I use. I like the idea of having a car card because on the back of that card, I can write notes about who was the kit, who built it, what changes have been made to it, et cetera. So for me, it's part of my record keeping. Um, and what I did is I said, well, okay, so if I have that, and if I can put this card in a vinyl sleeve, and the vinyl sleeve I've got where you, where you can buy these things here, um, then I can basically put waybills in there. The waybills I created on an Excel spreadsheet, and they're kind of using a format that was developed by uh, by Tony Thompson and Tony Custer and several other people that said, well, we want more prototypical looking waybills. You don't need to go to all this trouble, but you can if you want. And so what you do with these is, is you basically make up your waybills and you put several of those things uh, inside the plastic sleeve along with the car card. And between sessions, as you pull those things out, you rotate them, flip them back and forth in order to get the next routing that you want. This is something the, the layout owner does. And again, you can make up as many waybills for a card as you want because you're only showing one at a time for a move. So that works out pretty well. Uh, there's other, other modelers, and Tony Thompson is one of them, that has basically said, you know, we can eliminate the car card entirely because all the information you need can be contained on a scale model waybill itself. And so again, here, if you look at this, is, is the waybill on the left, you'll see up at the top, it's got the car initials, it's got the car number, it's got the car type, it's a box car, it's 40 foot, and here's where it says it's going to. Uh, next one over is very similar, except in this case, the car information is on the bottom of the waybill. And then the other two are just two other waybills, a similar format that basically has, uh, has more information on it. And it's for, very simple to, simplified from the prototype, but these guys use it, seems to work fine. I've op operated using that system and it's, it's a lot of fun. 
And they, they're usually in a plastic sleeve. And within that plastic sleeve, there's actually several waybills topped, you know, stacked on top of each other. So between sessions is they can flip these things around them and change them as they want. So the hard part about all of this is, is how many waybills and how do you set things up? And so this is just a, a, a short um, sheet that you, you can put together. Actually, this, this came out of uh, something that uh, Model Railroader published uh, on how to do that. I have a, had a much more complex one that just doesn't show well on the screen. So I'm opting to show this one instead. And one of the things you're gonna notice here is uh, on my railroad, Salida is in staging. So is Alamosa, but I've got destinations in both Salida and Alamosa. And, you know, we enter the real railroad here at Chama where, where these destinations and things actually exist. But what you do is you figure out is, okay, we need, we have inbound stuff coming to the Salida coal company. Well, what's it going to be? It's going to be coal. They're going to get about two uh, high side guns a week. Uh, We've also got the barrel transfer in Salido. That's that's going to take a lot of stuff, and it's going to be transferring mostly coal. And we're looking at eight to twelve cars a day here that are going to be routed to there. Uh, Ure, well, you can get there from from uh, from that, and that's a refrigerator. And it turns out that that particular refrigerator hauls beer. It's going to be one a week as the shipments out of there. And again, so this gets in there. Uh, Western Creosote is another place in Salida here. You've got inbound stuff, which is going to be raw ties, and you've got poles for treatment, maybe took a couple of cars a week. Uh, coming in off of the narrow gauge and uh, outbound is going to be flat cars, and it's going to be poles, mostly because the narrow gauge, at least in my case, didn't buy treated ties. So this is it, the same kind of thing at, uh, at Alamosa. So when you're done with this, you can kind of take a look at this and figure out, well, how many waybills do I need to need to make up in order to make this go? The other thing is, is that are you going to get it right? And the answer is no. You run a couple of sessions and then you start making adjustments based on how things go and what you want to see. There's really no right or wrong way to do this. And the, uh, the, the good news is, is the railroad provides empty cars for outbound service and they pick up empty cars from inbound. And uh, the reason they pick up empty cars from the inbound is if the shipper doesn't have anything to ship out of in them, and he says, I'm releasing this car, the railroad now gets to pick up the car cost of that, and he doesn't get to charge a per diem to, the, uh, to that company anymore. Kind of moving on to the uh, next stage here, which is, yeah, it's a plan for serving customers and doing it safely. One of them is, what trains are going to run in order to get all of these cars that we we're talking about to customers? And then if I got more than one train on a line, what's a method for keeping them safe? So right now we're just going to talk briefly about methods for keeping things safe. And in some future thing, we're going to come down to talk about what trains to run. So for keeping them safe, you've got the Grand 80, which is timetable. And this is this is as as old as the railroad, even before they had more than one train on there, you had a timetable. Why is that? Well, because customers needed to show, know what time to show up at the depot and what time they expected to arrive at the other end. Even if they only had one locomotive and one car they were pulling, timetable got them back and forth to do that. Uh, so what's that do? Well, that, that naturally gets into, for us model railroaders, a sequence. Yeah, do we need the fast clock to do this? Nope. We can run everything on a sequence if we want to. Uh, the other kind of a thing is, is a manual staff and block system. And that is uh, used where you have basically manual operators along there controlling who goes in and who goes out of that section of track. Or you can have a staff system. Staff systems were uh, big. In fact, I think they're still used in the UK in some cases. There was a staff system used on the South Pacific coast here uh, in order to safeguard a passage through a long tunnel and over over the top of a mountain on that. The other thing is you're an industrial railroad and you don't have a main track at all. And maybe you've only got one locomotive. So that simplifies everything right there. You just basically can do, do what you want to do and do it safely. However, you get more than uh, one train on the line, then all of a sudden you're now in the timetable and train order operation, which is the granddaddy. And that basically existed and was used for over a hundred years on that. There's a couple of other systems that actually work quite well, and they, they weren't appropriate to uh, narrow gauge, 
but they, they, they do work. One of them is track warrant control that involves radio and more modern things, but it's fairly easy to implement and works pretty well. And the other is direct train control, which is very similar to track warrant control, only it's a little bit less flexible. Uh, we have centralized traffic control listed here, but it really doesn't have any 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 place in uh, in neural gauge modeling, so we won't talk about it. So what I'd like to do is run through some uh, references for operations. Start with I went back to the neural gauge and shoreline gazette, mostly because a lot of you folks have that, and these are things you can go and look up. You may have overlooked the article the first time, but here we are. So starting back in. Uh, November of 2022, there's you know, an article on uh, replicating the commonplace where Greg Ta Condon talks about what he's what he's doing there. Uh, he also wrote about that again in September of 2022. In July 2022, uh, Gary Booth wrote a really interesting article on how he operates his railroad. And there's a lot of really interesting things in there that, uh, that can be considered. So this just goes to show there's really no right way or wrong way to uh, to do this, depending on where you want to be on the spectrum. Uh, again, more layout refinements, and that included uh, what trains to run. And uh, Greg Condon talked about that. For folks that like logging, is uh, Vinnie Pelletieri basically wrote a pretty good article in the in the Gazette in 2020 on how he operates his West Side in SN3. And then back to Greg Condon here. Um, Ken Eilers talked about his operations on his Pandora and San Miguel Railroad. And I've had the, the opportunity to operate on that. And it is a lot of fun. And his system really works well. September 2016, again for loggers, this is a standard gauge, but it's logging. Chris Lumbo wrote about how they operate his uh, Clear Creek Lumber Company. And uh, I haven't had the chance to operate on that, but I've been able to observe it. And those guys have a lot of fun. Uh, January 2016, Peter Leach talked about his small railroad, his uh, Wiscasset and Waterville and, and, and Farmington, and that, he came up with a pretty neat system on how he runs that too. Uh, you know, our Craig Simonson here, he's uh, published uh, how they how they operate his railroad in uh, 2015, and Craig's a guy that basically uses computer generated switch lists on that. Um, January 2015, there's a gentleman by name of Iverson basically said, well, he likes using spinners, chance, and playing cards and poker chips. And so he's got a really interesting way on how he uh, do, does things there. Harry Brunt talks about how he was well, you know, planned or ran, run, ran his railroad up Clear Creek. Um, November 2000, Brian Ellerby talked about how we operate uh, in Nighthawk. At 1999, Brunk again in November and September had a couple of articles again on operating uh, his railroad. January 98, as Craig Webb described, designing a railroad with a night operation, but he really spends a lot of time on operation, and it's really a neat system and works well for those guys. 1997, as Dave Kloon basically wrote a really good article on operating his Cascade County narrow gauge. And in 1994, and this is a really neat article, uh, Bob Christofferson and, and uh, Brian Ellerby again wrote Operating Night on the Neuro Gauge. And this is a multi-page article that kind of goes through an awful lot on, on uh, how they were operating various railroads in the area at the time. 1992 is John Coker starts talking about, well, how, how the prototype guys do this. Mel Graves in 1992 wrote about how he operate, operates his large RGS railroad. 86, we're back to logging with Daryl Meralt on, the, on that, based on the Dolly Varden mine. Uh, Lee Rainey wrote on the, the Weensburg and Washington Railroad in 85. And then Rick Steele started writing about prototype operations and things in a, in a series of articles uh, over, over several issues in the Gazette. They're, they're well worth a read. And then if we got, kind of go down here, uh, we look at Model Railroader. The, uh, one of the things you can look up is Operation on the San Juan Central, written by Malcolm Furlow. And he runs through how he basically arranged his car card system and how he set that up and, uh, and, and ran it. And then the latest word from Doug on card operations and Doug Smith. This is where you're going to see the, the granddaddy of the car card and waybuild system, if you will, on that. And then Francis Adams wrote a couple of interesting articles uh, 
Also in 1960 and 63, uh, car distribution, a realistic way to generate traffic. And then what do you do with empties? And both of these things have certainly have applications to, uh, to narrow gauge. The big difference is we don't have to worry about car service rules in returning the cars back to the original owner, mostly because unless you're operating the area where some of the narrow gauges did interchange cars, is the car rules of service don't apply to us. So looking at a couple, another, another reference here, uh, this you can download from trains.com and or you can read it online or as a PDF. And it contains, as you can see on the left, a number of things. And some of them are, are gonna help with uh, with a lot of things here. And one of the things in it, it's got a number of uh, just short one pagers written by Span Andy Sparandio on a variety of operating uh, topics. And it's uh, really worthwhile. And lastly, we'll just kind of um, end here with a couple of, um, I'm gonna say heavier, heavier um, things to think about. One of them is, a compendium of model railroad operations. This is not cheap. You can buy it from the uh, Operations Special Interest Group. Uh, there's a website address there, uh, and it's still available. It's going to cost you, I don't know, somewhere between 40 and 50 bucks, I think, by the time you get shipping and handling in there. And um, if you are new to operations, it'll probably scare you to death. But it's a book worth having as, as you get into it. Uh, the other one up there is out of print. And it is specific on timetable and train order operations. And unfortunately, it's out of print. And this book is really in two sections. The first section is written by a prototype TT and TO dispatcher. And the second section was written by Steve King, also a prototype TT and TO dispatcher, but also a model railroader. And so he describes how you apply TT and TO to model railroads. Uh, then, of course, if you got Tony Custer's uh, um, book on operations. This is the second edition, which has been expanded. It's got a lot of mainline stuff in it. But in general, the uh, the principles and everything for, for operations, et cetera, hold true. And then lastly, and this was published a long time ago, and it's out of print, and it was also by Combat. You'd have to find this on eBay or something of this sort. And that was Bruce's Chubb's books. This was written back in the day of DC block control and running the rotary switches and everything else. So there's a lot of things in there that accommodate that. But otherwise, the prototype information, et cetera, that they come up with in, in this book is, is really still good and still relevant. So at that, I would basically like to conclude and say, well, uh, with any kind of luck is we're gonna kind of continue with this series. You won't always be hearing from me. We're gonna have other guests on here to talk about other other aspects, and I don't know whether we're going to be talking about trains and schedules or whether we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, the, you know, setting up a more robust uh, car distribution system or what, but we'll get that figured out and see what happens. Anyway, uh, I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I hope that if you haven't thought about operations, you might want to give it a thought because it really is is a lot of fun and you can keep it simple or you can take it to whatever extreme you want. Thank you, Dave. This is Robin and uh, I've been asked to monitor the chat um, for any questions and there are a few. Um, Jonathan Sauer says, love the article, Dave. Uh, you just gave me a lot of reading homework. Yes, you did. <laughs> Bill Hobbs says thanks. And um, R. Kerr says, Dave, great presentation. And Jonathan asks, we be covering the dispatcher's role in future talks. So I'll answer that in just one second. And Jim Brown says, thanks, Dave. Really interesting. So to answer that question about the future, um, Dave did say we're going to try and get some different people to cover maybe a little bit more detail on some of these topics. And um, car cards is one of them. You know, Dave talked a bit about that. And then how we actually run the railroad, whether it's um, with a dispatcher, mm -hmm. timetable and train order operation, or using track warrants. Those are all possible things. And um, I think I might be doing one in maybe a few months time about really easily getting into the operations side in terms of track warrants and dispatching without making it an incredibly complex production. So make it easier to get into it. So that might be the next thing. And so to answer um, Jonathan Sauer's question, yeah, we will be discuss discussing what that role is. 
but it doesn't have to be in this incredible amount of detail. Yes, it can, and if you want to, absolutely great. That's one end of <laughs> the spectrum Dave mentioned. So are there any other questions? Uh, you know, please put them in the chat. And if you have any feedback about how you want any of these future sessions, this topic to go, please let us know. Oh, uh, Je Jeff Schultz says, um, thank you, Jeff. I believe you can download 19 East copy three, that OPSIG book in PDF format, if you're a member of OPSIG, and that's well worth a year's membership. You can download it for free. Yeah, it, it is a really big, thick book. It's on my bookshelf. Oh, you can't see it behind me. It's somewhere in Newcastle Station behind me. It is a really thick book. So the PDF is going to be a challenge. But um, if it's free and those books are expensive, that's a pretty good way to go. Any other questions in the chat? Well, I think you've stunned them, Dave. So yeah, um, <laughs> e e email any of us, Jerry, Russ, myself, Jeff, Dave, Pete, uh, if I've missed anyone, I apologize, uh, or Mark, um, though he's not with us mm -hmm. today. Email us if you have any ideas how you'd like this to go in future. Um, a bit like we did with DCC, um, we're going to try and go through some different focuses on it okay. to make it easier to get involved at the level you think is um, appropriate. Yeah, and Bill Hobbs just said on the chat uh, a few years ago, he created an Excel spreadsheet that represented shippers and receivers in a matrix, mm -hmm. each shipper getting a row and receiver getting a column. Yeah, there's ways in which you can generate, you know, we maybe have some stuff we could share and we can do that on the groups.io, some spreadsheets yeah. or the templates we can share would be a great idea. Anything last words, Dave? I, I don't think so. I uh, hope I didn't put everybody to sleep and... Uh, we can get on with the rest of the program and uh, L, L's layout. That, that'd that be great. Okay. Thanks, thank Dave. You, uh, just you, wanted, just, uh, thanks, Robin. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Dave for taking the time to do this. Um, I started off in trains with operating and I get sort of thrown in the deep end with a large HO scale club in Toronto, given a yard to operate and uh, I'd never done it before. So, um, and it was a great way to learn uh, how I didn't understand how train operations. I was just a, the average hobbyist and I didn't really, hadn't really thought about it. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting, fascinating and uh, engaging part of the hobby.